My name is Craig Newbill. I'm the Executive Director with the New Mexico Humanities Council. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this series on water tonight, Water Crisis in the West, Thinking Like a Watershed. I'm the Executive Director for the New Mexico Humanities Council. We're very proud to be supporting this program. Uh, also supporting this program is the Christensen Fund and the historic Chemo Theater. Tonight's panel, Water Law in the Southwest, is made possible from a grant by the New Mexico Humanities Council. You'll recall that that first panel was focused on an overview of human habitation in the Southwest, and I've heard comments that that was a very confusing panel. Well, know that we had three, uh, you know, very uh, visible scholars who like to uh, argue and challenge each other. And really what we'd ask them to do is why don't you stir the pot? Let's talk about some of these issues that are out there. We're not asking you to resolve them and, or talk about them in detail, but stir the pot for these other panel sessions that come along. And so I think that one was a little uh, more difficult uh, to get some sense out of. The second panel presented uh, <clears throat> indigenous perspectives and address sacred, sacred, sacred and economically oriented attitudes about the relationships between the human culture and habitat. And I think that one was a little easier to grasp. The third seemed to be, uh, as I talked to you uh, outside after the event, one that most people got a little more out of. And uh, from a humanities perspective, they talked about this relationship uh, between humans and the environment. So the first panel was intended to stir the pot in addressing global change and climate instability. The second was an overlay of a cultural mosaic of multicultural perspectives that articulate a number of viewpoints held by the indigenous speakers concerning nature and homeland. The third continued that dialogue with ties between habitat and humans, examining the scarcity of water both above and below the ground and exploring this water scarcity due to global warming, climate instability, drought, and overextraction. So here we are discussing ideas and perspectives in these panel discussions, and we're not really relying on raw data and quantitative analysis. We're not offering final solutions to this. We're trying to identify re recurring problems and themes in the water shortage issue here. We're not advocating one particular point of view or solution, but discussing historic events and cultural practices as they relate to water. So tonight's discussion includes three distinguished writers and thinkers who will be introduced by the panel moderator and project director of these public programs, Jack Leffler. I've shortened his introduction a little tonight so we can get right to the meat of the matter, as it were. Some of the hot topics we hope to discuss are water law in the West, the gospel of efficiency, the Colorado River and Rio Grande compacts, Indian water law, and the 40-year water law between California and Arizona. I'll be watching time. A resident of the American Southwest since 1957, Jack is an author, radio producer, oral historian, and a Southwestern water scholar. His radio series and individual programs include Moving Waters, the Colorado River in the West, which was a seven-state project of upper and lower basin states, which was funded by the State Humanities Councils again and the NEH. His books include Thinking Like a Watershed, Survival Along the Continental Divide, and Healing the West, Voices of Culture and Habitat. I believe there are books for sale uh, up front, and we will have those uh, open after uh, this panel concludes. So with that, please join me in welcoming Jack Leffler. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Good evening, and thank you all so very much for coming here this evening. This is panel number four in Thinking Like a Watershed, Water Crisis in the West. And we have up our map that we have every time, the map that was rendered by John Wesley Powell back in 1890 or so. This shows the watersheds of the West and John Wesley Powell's whole idea was that we organize ourselves by watersheds rather than the strange geopolitically organized states that we ended up with. One of the things that Powell was really opposed to was the whole notion of interbasin transfers of water. And of course, that's what's happening big time all over the West today. As Craig said, our whole point is really to try to, over the whole span of four panels, five panels, 
to create kind of a, an overview or a sphere of reference about aspects of what we have to think about when we're thinking about water problems, but also some of the reasons for these water problems that we have. And it seems that tonight is a particularly important panel because it focuses on water law in the American Southwest. And the original concept was to try to give a sense of the evolution of water law in the American Southwest, and that would take several days. It's actually one of the most complex subjects we can possibly imagine. But we have some really great folks tonight, people who really understand water law, who can speak concisely. Uh, we have with us tonight M. Hall, who used to work for the State Engineer's Office, who has taught uh, very long and well at UNM. We have Bruce Frederick, who is currently with the New Mexico Environmental Resource Department. And he's going to talk about the Plains of San Augustine water debacle that we're trying to thwart. And then uh, from the Zia Pueblo to speak to us about Native American perspectives concerning water is Peter Pino, who is a former tribal administrator at the Zia Pueblo. And these three people really have a, an awful lot to say. So I'm now going to sit down, shut up, and bring out our panelists. And thank you again for coming tonight. Before, one last thing. Our last panel in this series will be on June 26, just not that far in the future. And it'll feature John Fleck, who is the science editor with the Albuquerque Journal, Mike Hammond, who's the area director for the Bureau of Reclamation, and Sonia Dickey, who has just finished recently her PhD dissertation on the effect of the Glen Canyon Dam on indigenous peoples. And she's prepared to talk to us about the Central Arizona Project, which affects us very much here in New Mexico. So again, thank you all for coming. And thank you for being such a loyal audience. And now I'd like to introduce our panelists. This is Bruce Frederick Hi. from the New Mexico Environmental Law Center. This is Peter Pino from the Zia Pueblo. And here we have M. Hall, wonderful fellow. Each of our panelists will speak for 10 or so minutes this evening about perspectives that they feel are important to talk about. And we're going to start this evening with M. Hall. So thank you. Thank you, Jack. Is this on? Yeah. Good. Uh, I'm used to working without a net. Um, I'm not sure if I'm wired this way. No, is it working? No, here, let me see your. Yeah. No, it's not that, though, the thing in your pocket. There it is. Does it have a green light? Yeah, it has a green light. How's are. that? Better we're on the same. Uh, <laughs> When Jack uh, asked me to come talk to one of these wonderful sessions that he's been putting on, I asked him what he wanted me to talk about. And he said, why don't you talk about water law for 10 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought about that for a second, because um, water lawyers, once they get started on water law, <laughs> have a lot of trouble stopping um, after 10 minutes or 10 hours. Uh, and um, trying to get a water lawyer to, to describe water law in 10 minutes is a little like trying to get uh, Melville to describe uh, the white whale in five. Uh, it can't be done, and part of the problem is the measure of obsession uh, that both water lawyers and Melville had with <laughs> with white whales. Um, so I'm going to try to do my best to uh, stick to 10 minutes tonight, but it, it won't be easy. Um, I thought that one way I should try to do that maybe is, is to figure out who was the wisest man I ever knew who could say something about water law uh, very, very briefly. And that turned out to be, made me think of Steve Reynolds, 
uh, for whom I worked, and many of you may know who he was. He's a late state engineer, and he was a state engineer for a long, long time in New Mexico, and had more of an influence on New Mexico water law than anybody else. And when I started my career as a water lawyer, I went to Reynolds and said, well, can you tell me about the relationship between water and law? And he said to me, water is intricately and extensively regulated by law. And then he quit. <laughs> That's all he said. Uh, and the reason Reynolds said that was because he was warning me <laughs> to stay out of the water business until I got some of the vocabulary together uh, because he believed that you had to know something about water before you could actually talk about it. Um, and so <laughs> I may or may not know something about water, but I'm here nonetheless. Uh, I do want to say that, that there's a lot of, especially in New Mexico water law, a lot of magic language. Uh, and if you want to talk to the water bureaucrats and the water lawyers in New Mexico, you've got to try to learn some of that language. I think of groundwater uh, and the language of groundwater, which involves uh, what you would normally think of as being Esalen Institute talk uh, about sustained yield, uh, about cones of depression, uh, about different kinds of of groundwater performance, it really sounds like psychological terms, parapsychological terms. Uh, and people who are involved in this business would frequently test you uh, and see if, <laughs> if you got the concepts right and the lingo right uh, before they'd actually take you seriously. Um, so I think that one of the things that we really have to do, and that I'm trying to do tonight, is to get beyond that. We get beyond the secret language of, of New Mexico water uh, and down to the basics of what's going on uh, and how it works. Um, when Reynolds said that, that New Mexico water was intricately and extensively governed by law, uh, what he was really referring to was the 1908 water code <laughs> that was the basis for New Mexico's whole system of administering uh, water rights for a long time. Uh, it started in 1908, and I'll talk a little bit about those beginnings. Uh, it continued through Reynolds' regime, and it's still there today. Uh, the 1908 Water Code's basic values about, about water. Uh, what's happened today is that those central concepts, concepts from the 1908 Water Code have been surrounded and embedded in a whole lot of other <laughs> legal doctrines <laughs> that compete uh, with the New Mexico vision, uh, the unilateral vision from the 1908 code. Um, those doctrines which surround now the 1908 code and have a lot to do with it include interstate compacts, which weren't there in 1908, which are very much with us today. Uh, Apportionments under re, uh, re, um, interstate compacts are superior to every manner of state law. <laughs> no state water rights attach until all interstate obligations are fulfilled. That's a powerful drag on the 1908 code. Um, there are supreme federal laws, that is supreme in the sense of being superior to state law by virtue of being federal government law. Uh, and those include things that didn't exist in 1908, uh, like the Endangered Species Act, like the uh, Environmental Protection Act, like the Clean Water Act, those great federal acts of the 1960s and 70s, uh, which also have surrounded and impacted that basic 1908 code. You have Native American uh, rights, <laughs> um, which exist as a matter of federal law and outside entirely of the state water systems. Um, so that, that uh, and Mr. Pino will talk about those, I think, today. But what you have going on um, is a, a central <coughs> body of state law surrounded by <laughs> very different bodies of federal law working in very different ways. 
Some of the bodies of different than state law are not fully defined yet. Uh, and I'm referring in particular to Pueblo Indian water rights, which are incredibly important in the management of the resource about which we know almost, well, we know a lot, but we have not been fully defined yet and could have an incredible impact on water rights in our system. So, so the, 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 the doctrines that have embedded and surrounded the prior appropriation doctrine had embodied in the 1908 code um, are, are, um, are undefined, uh, and the relationship between the doctrines, even if we understand them completely, are also undefined, and I remind you what happened when the San Juan Chama Project water came up to, uh, to greet uh, the Endangered Species Act, and all hell came loose uh, as to which of those rights uh, we're superior under what circumstances. So water law is very, very complicated. And still at the bottom of all those laws is the basic 1908 water code uh, that defines state-based water rights uh, in our system. You've got a very complex system going on. And these doctrines in water law are struggling with each other all the time in ways that we don't know how, what their outcome's going to be. At the same time, the natural circumstances with which those rights deal are changing. Uh, the Rio Grande, which is what I'm fairly familiar with, has been fundamentally changed since 1600. <laughs> Human impact has probably reduced the discharge of the Rio Grande on a regular basis by over 50%. That is, takes more than 50% of the water out of the Rio Grande uh, since what, what was available in 1600. Um, and um, those changes are going to be exacerbated by our insistence on developing and mining groundwater. That is, taking more water out of groundwater aquifers than out of recharge, which is always happening. Uh, those combinations are going to make the, uh, put more and more pressure on this complex system that's relatively unadjusted. Um, that's to say nothing about annual droughts uh, and the long-term effect of, uh, of uh, global warming. So things are pretty much in chaos today. Uh, and if things get a lot worse, there's going to be this sort of people have been predicting it for years, this catastrophic collision between the natural systems that are reducing and the legal systems which are trying as best they can to, to govern the system through a system of water laws. Uh, there have been a bunch of responses to that, knowing that global warming's coming and droughts are coming, and there's going to be even more and more pressure on the legal system. Uh, some people have said, we should just jump the whole thing, the whole legal system, all of these embedded rights, the state rights underneath it, and we should just start again. <laughs> uh, and they've tried that in Australia. They've tried it in South Africa. Um, and, and people have said that we should try that here. I don't think it'll ever happen here. <laughs> it won't happen here because of the property rights that belong to people under the existing system. I don't think it'll happen here because the politics of water is so difficult uh, that to get something like that through the state legislature uh, would never happen. So I think that, that what we're trying to do is find a system that's flexible enough uh, to adjust itself to these changes that are coming with respect to supply and, and availability of water in this complex legal system. Uh, and one of the things that I'd like to talk about tonight is the possibility that the much maligned 1907 Water Code itself may provide the kind of flexibility uh, that would allow for the adjustments uh, that we're coming on uh, that would allow some regulation uh, of the water supply without catastrophically destroying the whole thing. Um, let me just say this about the 1907 Water Code. It came here in 1907. It was brought to New Mexico by Morris Bean and the Bureau of Reclamation. It was called the Bean Code. It was a federal program, but adopted as state law. 
And it was based on the premise that you could secure entitlements to water by taking water from where it naturally occurred and applying it to use somewhere else and making it do something that nature wouldn't do without the intervention of man. That's the whole basis of the 1907 Water Code. And it is incredibly <laughs> offensive to those people who are interested in the integrity of natural resource systems. Uh, but the 1907 Code has, has provided some flexibility. Uh, and let me just say, I don't know how I'm doing for time, uh, but the kind of flexibility uh, that, that I'm talking about, what's happened in the 1907 Code is that there have been really three successive waves of change to the 1907 Code in response to different kinds of resource problems. In the 1925 to about 1935, uh, they took the 1907 Surface Water Code, that is, it was a code that only applied to rivers, and applied it to groundwater. For the first time ever in the Western United States, New Mexico was way ahead of any Western state in trying to apply the doctrine of prior appropriation of surface water to groundwater and bring it under legal control. It showed some flexibility in its ability to do that. Then between uh, 1955 and about 1970, New Mexico went to the next step. Not only was groundwater and surface water covered by the same basic doctrine of, of, of prior appropriation of 1907 or 8 rights, but Reynolds <laughs> combined the two and said, not only are we going to treat these resources as covered by the basic legal rules, but we're also going to recognize that they are interrelated, geologically and physically. Uh, and that sent New Mexico once again way ahead of any other Western state before its time. So under the 1907 code, there has been some power to make adaptations uh, to change circumstances. There's, I think that coming has been the beginning of a, sort of a fourth wave of changes to, or additions to the prior appropriation code in its ability to value and adjust to changes in the physical environment in a way that it would protect the natural resources of water. I think you can see that even in the city of Albuquerque's drinking water project, the very recent one, where they switched to essentially surface water in the name of relying not on mining groundwater to extinction, uh, as one would mine any resource, but as trying to move toward a sustainable resource for a long period of time. That only went part of the way there. It didn't eliminate groundwater mining. Uh, but it was an incorporation um, in the, uh, uh, under the 1907 law ideas about sustainability as, as, as a value that the system ought to protect. Um, and so I'm sort of interested in the possibility that, that the great values will come not from federal law, or, and they've helped a lot, uh, but from actually moving state law into a more uh, uh, ecologically friendly uh, way than it has been before. And when I think about doing that, I think about the basic foundations of New Mexico water law. Uh, and they're embodied, interestingly enough, in Article 16 of the state constitution. Most Western states don't have their water provisions in the state constitutions. New Mexico does. That means that it's elevated to the highest law level that law can, and it essentially sets the boundaries for state legislative responses to this. And really, Article 16 says a couple of things uh, that are important. One is, is it says that the unappropriated water belongs to the public. That's in section two of Article 16. It's a declaration in a complex way of a continuing public interest in water, even that's fully privatized. And I'll go into that in more depth if you want me to. But that's one part of, 
of Article 16, the state constitution. The other part of it that is Section 3 that says that beneficial use shall be the basis, the measure, and the limit of a right to water. Beneficial use isn't defined in the state constitution. Um, and what the courts have said pretty much is that the state legislature can define beneficial use in whatever way it seems best. It seems to me that it's possible that beneficial use could be extended, as have these other areas, in order to incorporate the economic and sustain, uh, not the economic, the ecological uh, and sustainable use of water as itself a fundamental beneficial use under the Constitution, and that we could move state water law toward that, that goal um, more clearly. We've done that a little bit. We've done it when we respect what they call in-stream flows. Uh, that is, we finally agreed that water in place in a river can be a beneficial use of water. Uh, the old guys would have rolled over dead. The best Montana river in the 1950 was a, a river without water in it, because that meant that everything was being used for beneficial use off the river and for economic purposes. In-stream flows are a real bridge against that. And so I, I think that that's important. I, 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 have I taken too much time? Well, Do I, I think we're, uh, yeah, I have another minute. Then give me one more minute. How about 90 seconds? No. Okay. <laughs> I'll trade you. <laughs> the other, I, we're making small avenues with respect to that. The second one that comes up is uh, the recent New Mexico appellate court's recognition of the existence of a non-consumptive beneficial use. <clears throat> the old water buffaloes, guys like Steve Reynolds, would roll over in their graves at the idea that you could have a use that was non-consumptive, because this whole system was based on the fact that use meant consume it off the rivers for economic purposes. This is a recognition that maybe you can have uses in the river that are beneficial uses themselves. Those two concepts will, that is the public nature of water and beneficial use as a basic ecological system, uh, may allow us to move forward toward a more responsive, flexible system of water law uh, and that's what I would have told Leffler in 10 minutes, uh, except that he gave me another uh, minute and a half. So thank you very much. That's my pitch. And uh, that's great. <laughs> thank you, Em. Now, Em knows so much. Uh, one of the things I'd like to quickly mention is that I read somewhere that I haven't really verified. It was probably in an article I wrote, but at any rate, <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> There you go. Um, New Mexico, authority, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> New Mexico, relatively speaking, has less surface water than any other state. We have about 121,000 square miles of land area, and we have only about 230 square miles of surface water, which <laughs> is the stuff on top. And the groundwater that M was talking about is what exists in aquifers. And I wanted to quickly point out which I may have mentioned in an earlier panel, but Paul Bauer, who is a really interesting hydrologist down at uh, New Mexico Tech in Socorro, uh, told me that until 1982, and I remember this back in those days, that until 1982, it was thought that Albuquerque itself sat over the equivalent of Lake Erie. Right. And that is not the case. It was discovered in, then that there are pockets of water and uh, so that's why more and more is being taken from the Rio Grande. And something that we must always remember is the San Juan Chama diversion, which brings water from the Colorado River watershed through a 23 long mile tunnel into the Rio Chama and then into the Rio Grande. And Albuquerque is supposed to get 50,000 or 48,000 acre feet a year. I believe from that, and Santa Fe is supposed to get about 5,000 acre feet a year. And maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But now I want to introduce, reintroduce Bruce Frederick, who is 
done a magnificent thing down in the plains of St. Augustine. And so I'd like to welcome Bruce. Go right ahead. Uh, thank you, Jack. Uh, I want to thank you for inviting me on this panel with him and Peter. It's a, it's a real honor and uh, kind of a surprise. So uh, thank you all also for coming out to the Chemo Theater uh, on a Thursday night, actually not to see music or to or listen to music or see a show, but to uh, talk about talk about water. I mean, what could be better than that? Uh, as I think uh, Jack said, uh, I'm with the Environmental Law Center, New Mexico Environmental Law Center. Uh, we're in Santa Fe. I'm a lawyer, of course. Uh, the Law Center is a nonprofit law firm. We practice in the areas of environmental law, water law, and environmental justice. Uh, the Law Center provides free or low-cost legal representation to communities environmental groups, and uh, individuals. Uh, currently, I represent about 80 people in a fight over water in Catron County, uh, New Mexico, that's been going on for about seven years. Uh, the fight centers on an application uh, to privatize a very large public uh, supply of groundwater. Uh, so far, uh, we're winning the fight. Uh, we've convinced the state engineer and a district court judge uh, to deny the application because, uh, in our opinion, it's inconsistent with the prior appropriation doctrine, uh, which before it was codified in the 1908 code was actually part of our common law uh, back into the 19th century. Uh, this case is far from over. Right now it's pending in the Court of Appeals and ultimately it's probably going to be decided in the New Mexico Supreme Court. Uh, the fight in Catron County I think is relevant, uh, generally relevant, uh, because in my opinion it illustrates what is the classic struggle uh, between private and public interests in western uh, water. And that struggle has been going on for about 150 years in one form or another. Uh, Catherine County also highlights, and I'm, I'm with him on this, uh, because I don't think the prior appropriation system is, is totally evil. I think in the Catherine County case actually highlights uh, the aspects of prior appropriation, uh, the positive aspects of that system that tend to be overlooked uh, these days. So the fight in Catherine County and actually throughout the West, in, in my opinion, is over control of water. And on the one side of that are uh, what I'll just characterize uh, as foreign speculators. And I call them foreign speculators because historically, uh, these are folks, uh, these are wealthy investors from Europe, uh, from the eastern United States. Uh, today, of course, they might be from anywhere in the world, including here in the West. Uh, what they all have in common is that they want to acquire and monopolize, really, uh, Western water supplies, and not for their own use, uh, but, for, but for sale to third parties. And to a speculator, uh, water is no different than gold or any other kind of valuable mineral deposit. It can be bought, it can be held indefinitely, it can be transported any distance to market, and then when the price is right, it can be sold for a, for a profit, of course. On the other side of that fight are local people uh, who actually use and depend on the water uh, for their livelihood. Uh, and that's, those are people in Catron County. Uh, unlike the speculators, the locals usually don't have uh, a lot of money or a lot of power uh, on their side. Uh, what is on their side, uh, at least so far, at least up to this point, is the law of prior appropriation. And uh, as M pointed out, uh, water has a unique status in the arid west. Uh, New Mexico's constitution, like some other constitutions in western states, declares that water belongs to the public. And the, the technicality there, it's the unappropriated water, belongs to the, pro belongs to the public. I view that as water in streams. At, in, if it's in the stream or if it's in the ground, it's public water and it's subject to regulation. Uh, and that means, no, you can't privately own water in the ground or water in a stream. You have the right to divert it, but you can't own the water itself. And that's, that's actually 
a distinction that does make a difference. Uh, unfortunately, that's never stopped, and, and there's been many cases throughout history, it's never st stopped speculative investors from trying to privatize public water. Uh, the, uh, hope springs eternal there. Uh, no pun intended, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Catron County is, is really a case in point, and it's just one example of many. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, a wealthy, and I'm not making any of this up, wealthy Italian speculator named Bruno Modena and his son Vittorio uh, decided to buy a large ranch in Catron County, New Mexico. Uh, we know next to nothing about Bruno or Vittorio. Uh, we know some rumors. Uh, we know that they invested in a project in Maine uh, to establish an eco-resort next to Acadia a National Monument uh, that uh, the locals were able to buy them out of and dissuade them from. Uh, but there's really no hard information about these people. Uh, we just know they're Italian and they're wealthy and actually we don't even really know that. We don't even know if they really exist. Uh, I've seen the name on some paperwork, that's all. The ranch they bought in New Mexico is real. Uh, it's located between Daddle and Magdalena along Highway 60, uh, just east of the very large array. If you've ever been out to that area, then you know it's uh, extremely sparsely populated. Daddle has 50 people, uh, Magdalena has about 900, and there's three or four ranches in between those two, two cities. There's probably more than that, but uh, that's what it seems like to me. Uh, the Medenas purchased that ranch uh, in the name of a corporation called Augustine Plains Ranch. Augusta Inc. Uh, Augustine Plains Ranch, Inc. Uh, is the only New Mexico corporation I've come across that has a New York Fifth Avenue address. Uh, probably because it's, it, that's a more attractive address to uh, investors than Daddle, New Mexico. Uh, the, corporate <laughs> the corporate name, however, is local and it comes from a, uh, a land form in New Mexico in, the, in Catron County uh, known as the Plains of San Augustine. Uh, viewed from above, if you look at a topo map or you happen to be in a, uh, in a spaceship, uh, you'll see the plains of San Augustine look like a tilted, kind of a right tilted, oval shaped basin, uh, and the ranch is located right in the northeastern portion of that basin. Uh, it was formed, the basin was formed by a large freshwater lake that dried up about 10,000 years ago. Uh, lake existed in that location because precipitation in that area was once uh, a lot greater than it is today. And hydrologists have long uh, suspected, although the ranch claims to have uh, discovered this itself, I was actually at Tech in the 1980s and we were talking about this. Um, we've long suspected that much of this ancient precipitation is stored up as groundwater uh, in the basin fill aquifers uh, that lie underneath the plains of San Augustine. Uh, these aquifers are potentially thousands of feet uh, thick in some places, and Bruno and Vittorio uh, were obviously informed uh, that, that the aquifers underneath the ranch they were purchasing uh, potentially comprised a vast and largely untapped water supply. Uh, they eventually hired a hydrologist and based on some preliminary uh, studies, this hydrologist informed the Medenas uh, that they could mine 54,000 acre feet of water from the basin every year and not run out of water for 300 years. Uh, that in itself is probably wild speculation, but that's what their application states. 54,000 acre feet is a lot of water. It's about 18 billion gallons of water per year. That's enough to serve uh, conservatively 200,000 people. Uh, more than the combined populations of Las Cruces and Rio Rancho. Uh, you can irrigate about 18,000 acres of cropland with 54,000 acre uh, feet of water and, and probably more. So the Medenas must have thought they weren't buying a ranch, they were buying a gold mine. And uh, in 2007, Augustine Plains Ranch applied to the state engineer to, for a permit uh, to appropriate all 54,000 acre feet. Unfortunately for the Medanas, however, uh, their application had some serious problems and we were happy to point that out. Uh, under the law, 
uh, applications to appropriate, uh, and we're talking about uh, the groundwater code, which was an extension of the 1907 surface water code. Under that law, uh, you have to provide very specific information, uh, including a, a pretty detailed description of exactly how uh, you're going to beneficially use the water and where that use will occur. Uh, beneficial use, as you all know, is the basis, the measure, and the limit of the right to use water. And in fact, uh, those are the exact words that are written into our state constitution, and they form uh, the heart of the prior appropriation doctrine. Uh, after notice of the ranch's application was published, there are about a thousand protests filed, which is more uh, than any application in the history of the state engineer's uh, office. Uh, we represented about 80 protestants. Uh, we immediately filed a motion to dismiss based on the legal invalidity of the application uh, because, as I've said, it failed to describe any particular beneficial use or any particular place of use. Uh, what the application did instead was list uh, several vague uh, schemes that boiled down uh, to this. The ranch was willing to provide water to anyone for any purpose uh, anywhere in seven New Mexico counties, roughly a third of the state of uh, New Mexico. And that area ranged from Santa Fe County up north to Elephant Butte in the south. Uh, they wanted to pipe the water in the, into the Rio Grande. Uh, they wanted to pipe it up to Santa Fe or they wanted to just let it go down to Texas for compact compliance. They were, really weren't picky. Whoever paid for the water, they would sell it to them. And uh, the Medanas were forced to file this kind of vague application uh, because quite obviously they, did, they didn't have any particular need or use for the water, much less 54,000 acre feet of water. They just wanted a great deal of water uh, because they thought it would be a good investment. And but for the law of prior, prior appropriation, uh, it would be. Both the uh, state engineer and, the, uh, and a district court judge agreed with us uh, that the application uh, should be thrown out because it did violate uh, prior appropriation, uh, which requires an actual beneficial use. And uh, speculation about possible beneficial use is just not legally sufficient uh, to get a water right uh, in New Mexico. At least it's not sufficient yet uh, uh, until the Constitution is amended. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you mean you can. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, That's Bruce. That's a good cutoff part. <laughs> I want to interject something very briefly here. 30 years ago or so, I had the enormous pleasure of interviewing Paul Horgan, who was the author of Great River, the Rio Grande, and North American history, which remains to me the best history of this region that I know of, at least. And one of the things that Paul Horgan said to me, which is in my oral history archive at the History Museum in New Mexico, is that culture that came in from the East back in the early part of the 19th century was distinguished by having brought commercialism to New Mexico. And another way of looking at that is that the folks who moved in from the East had a real proclivity for secularizing habitat that was held sacred by the Native American people who lived here. And I just wanted to mention that to you. We have had a real proclivity for turning habitat and water into money. And somehow that seems to me some sort of a, a major violation of some kind of an ethical standard, but that's just my own personal opinion. But on that note, I want to ask friend Peter Pino to speak to us about his perspectives about some of these issues. Peter. Yeah, thank you, Jack. Um, when you read the poster and some of the uh, publication that went out, uh, John Eckerhawk is the individual named in, in those posters that he would be sitting in the chair I'm occupying tonight. Uh, he had a conflict, so he asked me whether I could sit in uh, as a panelist on, on this panel. 
John Yakohawk is the executive director for Native American Rights Fund based out of Boulder, uh, Colorado. Um, I sit on his board, and since I'm, I live here in um, New Mexico, in Zia Pueblo, he, he thought well, that I would be appropriate to fill his shoes, so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm here uh, tonight. Um, before I start, I have, I have a question. Again, I'm from Zia Pueblo. How many of you know where Zia Pueblo is at? That's good. A lot of times I, I ask and two or three hands would go up. Um, the Pueblo of Zia is on the Rio Hamas uh, river system, Rio Hamas watershed. And uh, in 1982, um, uh, USA versus Abulzaman was filed to adjudicate the water rights on the Rio Hamas. 1983, here he is, two, 2014, it's still in the courts. Uh, that decision hasn't been, been made. But um, going back in, in time, our forefathers were the ones that are, were responsible for the resources left around the Four Corners area. Um, Mesa Verde, Chaco Canyon, Hoven Weep, um, were occupied by not only Zia people, but uh, the other Pueblos that remain uh, today. There's 19 Pueblos here in the state of New Mexico. Hopi is a sister Pueblo that uh, has their villages in um, Arizona. Um, and one of the reasons why they left Mesa Verde and um, before, when they first came into the region, that's where they learned the art of farming. Prior to that, they were hunters and gatherers, and they moved with, with the game to be able to survive and uh, feed their families. When they got into the Four Corners area, and when I say, say Four Corners, I'm including what is now um, Pueblo country, they started to learn uh, the art of farming. And the first farming that they did was uh, dry farming, grid gardens, terraces, Today, we have about 2,000 acres of such structures, grids and, and terraces uh, northwest of the, of the Pueblo on the present Pueblo of Zia reservation. But the reason why they moved from Mesa Verde, because most of that was dry farming, they realized that it would be beneficial and was beneficial to, to supplement the rainwater by diverting water from the river and put in that water on the fields um, that they had planted. And it assured them a, a bigger and better harvest in the fall. So they settled in different river basins. And of all the tribes in the United States, the Pueblos were the only tribes that were never relocated by the Sp Spaniards, by the Mexican government, and by the US government. Our forefathers chose our homelands, and they chose those homelands because, they, because of the availability of uh, surface water, river water, and that's where they settled. And um, as the Spaniards and some of the other Plains Indians came later, the Pueblos were kind of used by convenience stores. Uh, they had the food, they were well established, but instead of coming to barter for some of that food they just took uh, from, from the Pueblo people. And when you look at the um, settlements um, that came later, they settled close to Pueblos. You look at um, Isleta to the south, just south of Isleta is Las Nunas. Um, then Isleta Pueblo, then you have Albuquerque, then you have Sandia Pueblo, then you have Ber Bernalillo, non Indian community. And then up the river, you have Santa Ana, Algodones, uh, San Felipe, um, Santo Domingo, uh, Peña Blanca, Ceili, Cochiti. And then when you go up the Jemez River, you have um, Bernalillo, Santa Ana, um, Zia, San Isidro, a non Indian community, Jemez Pueblo, and then Canyon and Jemez Springs up uh, into the Jemez Mountains. And when our forefathers first settled, 
they settled around the foothills of the Jemez Mountains. And when the Hispanics came, they did similarly settle around the foothills of the Jemez Mountains. Because of national security, Los Alamos got put right smack in the middle of the Jemez Mountains. And some of the later villages like Jemez Springs, La Cueva went further up into the river basin. And as a result, we started to um, uh, witness shortages of water, surface flow on the Rio Jemez. And like I said earlier, in 1983, the uh, water adjudication for the Jemez River was, was filed. And, and prior to that, um, we've always had to ration water. Um, and many people speak on the topic of water not ever really irrigating an acre of land, not being real farmers, um, but they talk about water. The people that know the best about water are the people that are using it at the, at the uh, local level. In 1972, March of that year, I told my mother that uh, my wife, Stella, and I were going to get married in the fall, September 30th. And my mother told me, well, son, if that's what you're thinking, you've got to plant chili and corn and uh, melon, squash, so that you could have that crop to feed the people that come to help us uh, prepare the food for the reception, for the wedding reception. So ever since 1972, I've been farming uh, to sustain my, my family. And I know what it is to be short of, of water. So in 1990, uh, we couldn't ration just within the, in the village because there wasn't enough water. So we called on our neighbors upstream, San Isidro, a non-Indian community to sit down with us and uh, plan on how we could share the scarce resource. So we did a five-year agreement, and we went with that agreement, and when it ended, we wanted to sit with them again to do another agreement. And their position was, why are you picking on, on us? There's Seamus Pueblo, and there's other non-Indian communities up the valley. Why don't you bring in those people in those communities as well? and let's all sit and talk about how we can share this scarce resource. So we sat down. There was attorneys present at that session, and every time somebody came up with an idea, they would um, interject their thoughts, and they were disruptive to the process. We eventually threw all the attorneys out of the room. <laughs> then we sat down with the agreement that we had done in 1990 with, with San Isidro. And uh, myself and an individual, Gilbert Sandoval from Hamish Springs, uh, went through the document and read each section. And, and when we read a section, we, we talked and, and we modified that agreement so that at the end, it encompassed the entire um, river, river basin, essentially. And once we came to terms, we called the attorneys back in. We told them that we had uh, reached the decision, and we instructed them to put the documents in, in legal format. Um, and so the Utten Center really liked what we, we did. There was a video that was done in 1995-96. Uh, and it was shared at a conference at the Santa Ana Hyatt once, once that video was, was completed. And essentially, we agreed that as Pueblo people, we have senior rights on the waters of the Jemez River. And what we planted were human-consumed crops, chili, corn, melon, squash. The non-Indians, especially Jemez Springs, just wanted to hear that water run through their acequias, through their village. Many of their irrigated areas were pasture for, for livestock. And like I said, some just put the water in the ditches so that they can hear the water running down close to their homes. 
um, San Isidro essentially was irrigating pasture as, as well. And so we essentially prioritized how that water would be used. The first priority or first right would be those to irrigate those crops that were consumed by, by humans. And they argued, well, livestock, if you graze them on pasture, you consume them or you sell them and you, you're able to feed your family. Uh, but nonetheless, they got second, second priority. And when the water really went to 17, um, um, I, I forget the measurement, seven, 17 CFS, uh, CFS thank you. Uh, the Pueblos could call on the water. And when we called on the water, because we had senior right, the non-Indians would have to shut down their diversions and allow the water to flow down the river so it get, could get down to Jemez Pueblo and to Zia Pueblo so that we could irrigate. And they would have to let the water grow, go for six, six days out of the week. And they would have one day to ir irrigate their pastures. And we did that uh, over a five-year period. And in, um, in 1994, we agreed that we would pull the, the case from the courts and that we would try to negotiate the rights on the Hamish River through a mediator. Uh, from 1994 to uh, 2012, we tried to negotiate the rights out. We could never do it. And uh, the obstacle was the state of New Mexico. Yeah, they had laws, but they had no water rights of their own. They were trying to regulate something that they didn't own, something that they really didn't understand, and yet they were imposing uh, their laws onto to the Pueblo. Ownership is, is key in mainstream society. Ownership was never a concept in Native American culture. We shared with the animals, the birds, all that were here on Earth with us. We had no right to exploit the resources for our benefit. We felt that there was enough to, to share. And that agreement that we did with the Pueblos and the non-Indians up the Jemez River Valley was in a sense based on that kind of a, um, a policy, unwritten policy. And we were fine with, with that, but uh, the state of New Mexico essentially said, you keep changing your mind. You're, you're not set. We make, you make commitments, you make obligations, and you break those obligations. And we felt that we never did that. But in, in a small session, we told them that, well, we maybe have learned from the best. <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, what do you mean? <laughs> and I said, well, it was your forefathers that broke all the treaties and the, and the agreements that they made, and you're now accusing us that we're not consistent with our commitments and our agreements. I don't think that that's, uh, that's true. They said, well, they said, well, we're, we're through trying to negotiate. And we said, okay, fine. So we're back in the courts. And uh, there was just a, a big hearing on the... Um, real Hamas adjudication a few weeks ago. But essentially, like I said, ownership is a foreign concept. Um, we're talking about natural, natural law. Natural law says if there's a resource, let everybody partake in that resource. It's because if you start obstructing and denying, then there's impacts. Uh, in this circle of, of life. Uh, whatever you do has an impact somewhere in, in the system. And so we've always been able to um, 
be able to share with all living beings, and Europeans are no exception. When your forefathers came, um, we had a conflict with them, the, the Spaniards, because they were trying to impose a religion on Pueblo people, and we already had our religion. And that was what the conflict was, was about. But once we, our forefathers said, okay, we'll be Catholics, that conflict subsided. And when that happened, we were able to share with one another because we felt that we had enough uh, resources uh, to go around. And when other Europeans came later, that was the same philosophy. But more and more in this society that we live in, uh, we sometimes feel that nice guys finish last. And that shouldn't be. Uh, that's going against uh, natural law. Um, and essentially, we feel that um, we should all be willing um, to take that kind of philosophy and be able to um, partake in what nature has put in, in front of us. Like I was saying, many of the communities built their villages around the foothills of the Hamas Mountains so that nature deposits those resources in the Hamas Mountains. It flows down and comes down to the foothills of the Hamas Mountains so that we could withdraw some of those deposits of, of resources and be able to share and be able to uh, benefit from, um, as a community from the resources that were deposited by, by mother, mother Nature. And our religion is based on, on um, because we live in a semi-arid region, based on always praying for rain. And I, I have a difficult time of the state government and the federal government excluding prayer from their uh, proceedings. Um, if you live in a semi-arid region, you always pray for rain and that doesn't cost anything. We all can pray for that, for that benefit. Um, we have no right to exploit the resources if we really think about sharing this with future generations, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our great-great-grandchildren, yet unborn. So seven generations, three generations back, present generations and three generations forward. And when you look at that, then you, you start thinking, well, I, should, I shouldn't be too wasteful of this scarce resource. And at least on the, on the surface, the river, you see what water is available. We don't know what water is underneath. Uh, people can tell you that there's abundance of water, but um, we don't know because we can't see underground. And uh, somewhere, if you keep going deeper, we've been taught as Catholics that there's a place called hell. <laughs> and I, I've made comments that why do non-Indians want to get down to the brackish water so that they can, they can use it? If they're not too careful, they may uh, tap into hell. And that will be the end of them. <laughs> but I don't want to be offensive to anybody. I, I wanted to put uh, some of this information out there to you as, as public so that you can think about this kind of things when you leave this session. Our grandfathers or elders have always said, when you have an opportunity to address a group, don't expect to connect with everybody in the room. If you can connect with one person, with one idea, with one concept, with one thought, and the person doesn't have to remember the right, right, at, right the next minute, or tomorrow, or next week, or next month. But if a light bulb goes off 10 years from now, 20 years from now, aha, I get what that person said at the Kimo Theater on May 29, 2014. Mm -hmm. I'll not, I'll, I now get it, and if one of you can remember that, concept or that idea 10, 20 years from now, then I've communicated. And as a panelist, we've been able to communicate with you. Thank you.
Thank you, Peter. Well, to me, one of the most important things that we could have done this evening was to not restrict the length of our panelists' <laughs> concepts that everybody wanted to get out there, because that's why we're all here. And so we're going to have a rather abbreviated panel discussion. But boy, between the three panelists, I think we've really covered some turf here. One of my issues that I've been concentrating on for a long time, and I'd mentioned it before the panel began, and which Peter really addressed very well just now, but looking at the relationship between human legislation and natural law, and all too frequently it would seem that human legislation is in violation of natural law, I would like to ask the panelists to think about that. Does anybody have anything they want to say about that at this moment in time? I noticed that one thing that M alluded to earlier on was that maybe some of those early folks would roll over in their graves if they thought that human use actually had to be <coughs> shared beyond just the human organism. For example, my friend Bill DeBuise, a friend of many of us here, uh, mentioned to me many years ago that at the beginning of the 20th century, so much of water law was based on the gospel of efficiency. Basically, we were looking at things solely from the point of human use. And as Peter brought out, we have to think in terms of the ecosystem itself, the whole biotic community, because we're part of that. And so is there any chance that law in New Mexico, if indeed New Mexico has this star reputation for being the furthest out of the states with regard to law, water legislation. How can we make that even to a bigger concept to include the ecosystem itself? Is this beyond law? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think we're on we're, our, the way to that a little bit. I mean, we're recognizing in-stream flow rights by any other name is simply a right that belongs to the river itself. I mean, there had been a famous law review article 20, 30 years ago about should trees have standing? Um, that is, should, should they be able to, to raise legal objections to their own to the way they were treated uh, in the way that natural resources should be able to speak for themselves, well, not for themselves, but, but that they should have an independent of uh, status in that system. And I, I think that we're moving in that direction because we have to, uh, because we'll pay a huge price if we don't. <laughs> and the whole thing will collapse uh, because it really does depend on, on a genuine respect for how resources actually operate. So if that's what natural law is, that's a good thing. Ooh, yeah, and I'm, I guess I'm uh, natural law, uh, it, it, it you know, to a certain extent, we, we might know what that is. Uh, it's, it, uh, when we get into the details, uh, there might be quite a bit of disagreement over what natural law actually means. Uh, if you ask, uh, uh, well, I, I actually was going to make an example, but I, I don't think I will because it involves religion. Uh, but uh, I think the law is adaptable, and I think uh, I think uh, an example is the Endangered Species Act, which is going to force flows uh, to protect the minnow. Unfortunately, there's a lot of due process that you have to go through to make that law effective, and there's decades of litigation. But I also think the, the prior appropriation is adaptable. Uh, 20 years ago or so, Letty Bielan with the Attorney General's office wrote an opinion that that just stated very clearly why you don't need a diversion to have a water right in the prior appropriation system. And then just recently, uh, the Court of Appeals came out with a decision called the Carangelo decision saying you don't need to consumptively use water to have a water right. And with those, you put those two together and you know, you've got in-stream flows or environmental flows or whatever you want to call them. 
today. The problem is uh, the way that's going to work is that there's going to be organizations like the Audubon Society or others that have to buy up rights and then transfer those into the, into the stream to make it work. It, it's not going to happen on its own. Uh, it, 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 takes act, it takes money, of course, and it takes uh, working with these bureaucracies to make it happen. Well, that's one of the things I wanted to bring up, isn't it? Could we construe contemporary culture as being economically rather than ecologically driven? Used to be. Uh, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the way prior appropriation worked. It was an economic doctrine. You took the water and you made it do something that it wouldn't do naturally in order to produce something that nature wouldn't produce on its own. It, there's a big strain of prior appropriation law that's full of that, and it's anti-natural it, it, by definition. And I wanted to, the, the positive part of the prior appropriation system, it developed in the 19th century. And the, the idea was it was, and you hear commentators and courts, uh, contemporary uh, you know, at, during that time, uh, calling the aim of the doctrine is to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And, and that's, that's what, the way it did that is it required, you couldn't establish a right a, a, unless you, you actually used the water and then you could only have a right uh, up to your actual use and if you failed to use it then it went to somebody else. And, and you know, on the negative side that was part of manifest destiny, it was to settle the West. But the idea was to spread out the water to as many people as possible. You've got to take that concept and now uh, broaden it to include uh, the natural world. Uh, and we're, of course, part of the net. We are the natural world. Absolutely, because we are a species yeah. of trillions of species that have lived. We're all descended from the same last universal common ancestor of about three and a half billion years ago. And so if we looked at it like that, uh, we're akin to the gnats that bite us on the legs when we go out and work in the garden. But uh, it seems to me, well, for example, there's a wonderful book. Well, it's pretty academic, and it's a little tough going. But a woman, I mentioned her just before our panel discussion this evening, uh, a woman by the name of Eleanor Ostrom. Uh, who got the 2009 Nobel Prize for Economics with her book, Governing the Commons. And her concept, along with that of her husband, was that governance for water rights should be based on what they called the polycentric system, whereby there was a state of reciprocity between the grassroots, say, with the Zia Pueblo, working through various levels, say through state government, all the way up to the federal level. But the, the grassroots level should have a really powerful voice in all of this. And that should have been based largely on the notion of sharing right down the line. You share the good years, but you also share the bad years. And that is not something that seems to really appear to me in current law. And the question is, and I'm sure that everybody here in this room needs to understand if we have a way of getting to some sort of a more realistic approach. The whole concept of manifest destiny, which was invented back in 1836 and basically claimed a God-given right for the people east of the 100th meridian to take over west of the 100th meridian regardless of the people who lived here, we're still living with that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that really has impressed me forevermore, this map shows John Wesley Powell's idea of having settled the west watershed by watershed. Now that's something that can't be done anymore. A big consideration here, and I've brought this out with every panel, that I've been, in my lifetime, the human population of the planet has more than tripled. And yet we have the finite resource of water here in the arid southwest. This is a big factor. How do we begin to square these things? In other words, 
Is there some sort of an imperative that can be evoked in order to straighten out thinking in the state legislature or in the minds of the economists, or is there not? Or do we have to become anarchists? <laughs> <laughs> this is being recorded, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I can't quite advocate revolution right now. I, I think, uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, un it's, it's a, lot of, uh, a lot of procedure and years of litigation to, to make changes that are necessary to make the system work for, for everybody and for everything. And unfortunately, with climate change, uh, you know, there's less and less water. We can, we can just write the hell out of laws, but we can't make any more water, and it's, it's getting more and more scarce. Uh, and, and I don't think the legislature is going to make it easy. Yeah, I understand. Uh, one of the things is that we're driven by our mores, and it's, that's a tough bias to get through. I've been presented uh, a few notions from the audience, and we have very little time, so we won't be able to address all of them, but here's one right on top, and I'll read this. I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing, but if anybody has any insights into this one. The U.S. federal government joined Texas in suing New Mexico for violating compact. How will this affect future water allocation? <laughs> Him. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to do with the Rio Grande Compact. Uh, New Mexico had always claimed that the state boundary is really at Elephant Butte Dam. Uh, and what New Mexico's obligation under the compact was to deliver water to Elephant Butte. Uh, and Texas is getting less and less water out of Elephant Butte because New Mexico intentionally <laughs> Uh, has uh, developed more and more groundwater resources there that take the releases from Elephant Butte that would otherwise get to Texas and take them through the, uh, the groundwater. And that's what's going on in that suit. Um, I happen to know New Mexico knew that this was going to happen, uh, and it's probably known for 20 or 30 years, so, so the chickens are coming home to roost, and we'll see what happens. Uh, <laughs> But, but that's what's going on with respect to that. The, as I say, the compact set New Mexico's obligation at Elephant Butte, and what happened between Elephant Butte and the Texas state land was anybody's, uh, anybody's game. Uh, which is why Steve Reynolds never took control of the groundwater below the Elephant Butte Dam as he did above the Elephant Butte Dam. He just let anybody take whatever they wanted to because he knew that that would be Texas water. Uh, I, I want to bring so, out something that here's a book oh, that, that book. M. Hall had a heap to do with the writing of, and it's called Raining in the Rio Grande, but that's R-E-I-N, not R-A-I-N. <laughs> so good book. Yeah, well. I finally got my very own copy, and I can return my borrowed one. <laughs> okay, here's another, another question from somebody. I have heard that some farmers in southern New Mexico don't have enough water to farm, and therefore are selling their water rights to private companies. Is this true, and if so, is it legal? <laughs> uh, yes and yes. <clears throat> wow. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what? because New Mexico has always said that water rights are property rights. Uh, and, and Reynolds, uh, despite what Peter says, uh, that they have marketability just like you, Reynolds used to say this, you could sell your home, you could sell your water rights, it's all the same thing. Except that there's a difference between something that's been humanly constructed and something that exists as a common pool resource. Well, and I, I meant to put, because the basic, it, it's important to say this, because the real reason for prior appropriation 
uh, in the old conception of things, and it comes out of the California gold, gold fields, uh, was that if you wanted to use water, you had to invest money in order to develop the resource, because it wasn't a resource in place. It had to be moved <laughs> to another place in order to make its activity valid. That was for washing gold, for irrigating alfalfa fields. It required an investment. And unless you protected that investment, nobody could take the risk of developing the resource. It's an economic doctrine at, at bottom, and it's a way of protecting resources necessary in the view of these people to develop the resource and take the water from where it naturally occurs and apply it to beneficial use someplace else. And that's why they protect it as a property right. So it's changed a lot, but that's it. The bottom line, that's where it all started, and we're still working around the edges of that. So and I want to, the, my, my answer is no, uh, yes and yes, that, that their water farmers sometimes don't have enough water and that they are, that they can sell off their water rights, uh, sell, and when you say sell, you mean sever them from the irrigated property and move them someplace else. Uh, that's very possible, it happens all the time, but you can't do it unless you go through a pretty detailed state engineer process. There has to be notice. People get a chance to protest if it's going to impair their water rights or if they think it's contrary to conservation of water or if it's detrimental to public welfare. Those last two things don't have any concrete meaning, and the state engineer generally ignores them, uh, but they're, they're written into the law. So it's not an automatic that if you just get up and want to sell your water right, that you're actually going to be able to do it or it's going to be easy or fun <laughs> or that you'll make any money. And if, you're, if you haven't historically used all the water you're entitled to on paper, you can only transfer what you actually can show you used. And it's going to be limited by the historical supply and then further limited uh, if you weren't using it if you didn't use your full allocation. So it's not... Intricate and It's expansive. extremely intricate. Yeah. One of the things that M brought out to me a couple of years ago... I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, we were talking about the uh, San Juan Chama Diversion, mm. which is where 110,000 acre feet, well, yeah, 110,000 acre feet a year are being moved from East, uh, west of the Continental Divide to east of the Continental Divide. And Albuquerque relies on that 110,000 acre feet for close to 50,000 acre feet. And Santa Fe relies on it for about 5,000 acre feet. And I wonder if you could talk about how that pits us against the other side of the Continental Divide. There's a big debate about how secure those rights are to the upper basin allocation under the, uh, the, the compact uh, that divided the water between the upper basin states and the lower basin states. Uh, how secure uh, the amount of water is um, that comes through uh, from the Colorado side to the, to the New Mexico side. And there's a debate about that. The state engineer's office has done long studies and said there's no problem. Um, everybody else looks at it and said, it looks like trouble to me. You know, and, and other people, including myself, said, why would you do that? Why would Albuquerque essentially connect itself to Las Vegas, Phoenix, Los Angeles, and Tucson in the competition for water? You know you're not going to come out well <laughs> in that battle, you know, because you're dealing with the heavyweights over on the Colorado River. But it, 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 as I say, uh, as I tried to say, that that, that that reliance on the San Juan Chama water and, and the so-called uh, sustainability of its supply, we're talking about whether it's, it's as guaranteed or not, essentially changed Albuquerque's status with respect to water, because before that, it was mining groundwater, whether it was Lake Erie or whether it wasn't Lake Erie, it was mining groundwater. And what that means is you're taking out more than goes in 
and it's gonna, you're going to mine it to exhaustion. That's the mining law term, and it's terrifying with respect to aquifers, but it's guaranteed to happen in time if that's what the situation is. And they're still mining the aquifer uh, in, in Albuquerque, even with the addition of the, of the sustainable San Juan Chama water. That water is going to be gone. 2060 is what they think now is going to be another real shortage. And as with the engineers, they're saying something will happen. Phoenix <laughs> pumping water out of uh, Mexico, <laughs> exchanging it for Colorado River, all kinds of weird deals going on. Las Vegas is in real trouble because it got such a small allocation uh, of lower Colorado River water rights and is in desperate shape uh, to try to support its growth uh, by finding additional water supplies, mostly going to groundwater, which will be mined, uh, you know. Um, Out of the Great Basin Desert. Yeah. Uh, and, and boy, the ranchers, I've worked for those ranchers. Some people say, and I understand this completely, is you should never build cities on water supplies that you can't guarantee will be there uh, forever. That is sustainable water supplies. We're not doing that uh, with municipal supplies, even with these changes in, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the And then you're looking at Chaco. Way down the pike, they're going to run out of water. Yes, absolutely. Well, growth is happening. I mean, the, the cities sure. of the American Southwest are growing as rapidly as any cities in the United States. And here we are with ever more limited water supplies. And so we can anticipate hard times coming down the pike. And it was like Peter was saying earlier on, thinking in terms of center, seven generations, three generations in the past, our current generation, and three generations in the future. Boy, we have, what we do right now is going to have an enormous effect on our kids and our grandkids and their kids. The perpetuity definition in water law traditionally has come from the length of a mortgage that it took to capitalize the money to develop the water resource, 30 years. And so there's a vast and difference between 30 years and seven generations. Yeah, there is. And so there, therein lies the conflicting absolutes. We've, we've run out of time. Oh. We have, uh, but. I really want to thank everybody for coming to this panel. I'm hoping that some of the stuff that we got expressed out here this evening might have taken root. One thing that I would advocate is that we all have to get involved in this. I really do believe in the, the grassroots. I have infinitely more faith personally in the grassroots than I do from powers on high. And I think that there's a lot of intelligence in the grassroots. And if we do work together and take a big cue from our Native American friends who understand the concept of sharing rather than turning it into money, we might get somewhere. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.